order. Our hearing today is to hear from five of President Biden's nominees uh, in dealing with career positions uh, and ambassadorships. And it's wonderful to have you all here. We thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to Senator Ricketts for uh, being here to lead the Republican side of this hearing. It's not always easy to find members that are that have are willing to adjust their schedules in order to accommodate these hearings. And I thank Senator Ricketts for always being available to this committee to carry out our important work. I'm going to have some opening comments. Senator Ricketts is going to have some opening comments. But first, I want to uh, recognize Senator Reid uh, and allow him to make an introduction and thank him for being here in the committee. We sometimes have a friendly rivalry between armed services and foreign relations, <laughs> but since the National Defense Authorization Bill will be up soon and I'm going to need his help, he goes first. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Cardin, uh, Senator Ricketts, Senator Kane. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Christine J. Sari, the President's nominee to be Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. Anyone who has had the pleasure of working with Chris knows a couple of things. Number one, she is only partisan about one issue, University of Michigan football. <laughs> Number two, if you want to get something done, then you want to work with Chris. Time and again over her career, Chris has worked across the partisan divide to reach consensus on difficult issues. She's smart. She does the hard work to be well informed and she does the harder work to understand the views and goals of other people. She also has the integrity to follow through on her commitments. As a Senate staffer and as a senior advisor to the Department of Commerce and the Office of Management and Budget and the Department of Interior, Chris has earned a reputation as a problem solver and a coalition builder. Among other things, her work to permanently fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund laid the foundation for the Great American Outdoors Act. Most recently, Chris served as the president and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, where she transformed the organization into a leading voice for conserving and restoring U.S. waters, primarily by engaging local communities and businesses in stewardship. If confirmed as Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, Chris will bring her knowledge, her experience, her commitment, and her skills in coalition building to advance global cooperation in science and the environment. Mr. Chairman, as you know, it is vitally important to have the best talent to effectively move our nation's interests forward. In my view, there is no one more prepared and well qualified for this post than Chris Sari. I urge the committee's support for her nomination. And for Chris, I would say, go Wolverines. For me, I would say, go Army. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Once again, we have a little bit of controversy. It's go Navy and it's go Maryland. But other than that, you, you, you were fine. <laughs> thank you, Senator Reed. You're certainly excused. We appreciate uh, your input. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I'm going to shortly introduce the other uh, four nominees, but before I do that, let me just welcome our nominees and their families and thank you all for your willingness to serve in these public positions. These are extremely challenging times uh, to be in any position of uh, a foreign service. So we thank you for your willingness to, uh, to, to come forward. Uh, and we also thank your families because we know you can't do this without a supportive family. So strengthening global health security by applying the lessons learned from the COVID pandemic and implementing science-based approach and reducing spread of infectious diseases, that's very much on our agenda today. Advocating for international human rights standards, account accountability for past atrocities and good governance in Sri Lanka, as we support its economic recovery and stabilization of its financial system, very much on our minds. Building consensus to protect marine environments from illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, deep seabed mining and trafficking of endangered species, or banned toxic substances on our minds. A lot of issues we want to talk about. Protecting Moldova from Russia's aggression as it strengthens its democracy, implements anti-corruption reforms, and negotiates secessions with the European Union, uh, very much in, on the agenda today. Staffing the reopening of the U.S. Embassy and Seychelles 
with a full-time diplomatic presence to promote maritime security, combat drug trafficking, and protect the environment. For each of these missions, and, and including our, our, the mission in regards to uh, the uh, o uh, Oceans and International Environment and Scientific Affairs, I'm particularly interested in that. Uh, Maryland has one of the most recent uh, new uh, marine sanctuaries at Mellow Bay. So it's wonderful to welcome you all here. Uh, the subject matters uh, that you're going to be responsible for are ones that are critically important to our country. Uh, and let me yield uh, to Senator Ricketts for his opening comments before I introduce our nominees. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would add my thanks to all of you for your willingness to serve our country and for your families, for the sacrifices you go through. As governor, uh, I did uh, numerous trade missions around the world, and I really appreciate uh, all the Foreign Service people who helped us on those and the sacrifices you make to be able to represent our country. So thank you very much. Um, as the chairman said, you know, these are not easy jobs, especially uh, as we think about the time. Uh, it's so critical for the United States to advance our interests uh, in the security of the American people around the globe. Uh, today we're considering nominees for five important positions, all of which require you to contend with some of the greatest challenges facing the U.S. in foreign policy and national security than we've seen um, maybe in our history. Uh, Ms. Adam Smith, this is a critical year for Moldova. This fall, Moldova will hold both a presidential election and a referendum on EU aspirations. Moldova continues to face Russian hybrid warfare as Putin stops at nothing to replace the pro-Western leadership with a new government bought and paid for by the Kremlin. We cannot let Putin play puppeteer with the future of Moldova, and we must do all we can to support Western nations. However, Moldova's future is also dependent on the success of Ukraine on the battlefield. Uh, the only thing standing between Moldova and the Russian attack is a U the Ukraine army, which again, one of the reasons uh, why it's important we continue to support Ukraine. Ambassador Fitzroll, while the Seychelles might be Africa's smallest country in, in terms of population, uh, our 27-year absence um, in Victoria has created a vacuum. The PRC has been more than happy to fill, and so it's got uh, the Seychelles have a significant geopolitical um, uh, significance. If confirmed, you will face a difficult task of reestablishing an embassy basically from scratch. That's not going to be easy. We can't waste any more time. Uh, but appreciate your willingness to do this. This is vital and that we get it done right, and your efforts will send a clear signal to the Seychelles that we are back here to stay. Ms. Horace, for years, Sri Lanka has been a poster child for the dangers of the debt trap diplomacy of the PRC. Nothing illustrates this more than the port of Hambantota. Did I get that pronounced right? <laughs> okay, good enough. Uh, which was, uh, was eventually uh, forfeited to the PRC under that 99-year lease. Uh, reckless spending fueled by loans from the PRC and others has created an economic crisis in Sri Lanka, and it's struggling to dig itself out of that. What happens in Sri Lanka illustrates why the United States must provide viable alternatives to the PRC, and I'm encouraged by DFC's recent efforts to finance a shipping container terminal in the port of Colombo. These, uh, it's these types of strategic investments that were envisioned when the DFC was set up as a way to effectively push back on the PRC's Belt and Road Initiative. Ms. Harry, uh, OES has a broad portfolio, so I won't have enough time to cover everything. Uh, you would oversee. However, one area I did want to touch upon is the science and technology agreements, and in particular our science and technology agreement with the PRC. For years we've seen the PRC exploit research cooperation with the United States to steal technology and support its domestic civil, uh, domestic civil military fusion objectives. Uh, the Biden administration is currently renegotiating an STA with the PRC. Simply put, I and others have significant concerns. That's why I've introduced uh, common sense legislation that would ensure Congress is able to provide necessary oversight over any deal that is reached. I hope you would agree with me that when it comes time for something this important, the administration uh, should show its work for us. Um, this uh, legislation passed unanimously out of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and, and Mr. Chairman, I hope the committee will do the same. And then Dr. Nkinga Song. Okay, how close was I on that? <laughs> um, the position you were nominated for was created with the intent to help us get ahead of the next pandemic. I would note that when COVID first began this, um, to spread from the PRC, it was high-income countries that were hit first and hardest. It was in these countries we need to, needed to lead with diplomatic engagement, not development assessments. And in the PRC, uh, at the WHO, we need strong diplomats capable of negotiating access for investigators. If confirmed, I hope you will, uh, I hope that you can apply lessons learned and much needed diplomatic leadership so that we can properly prepare for whenever the next pandemic virus occurs. And again, thank you all very much for your willingness 
to serve. I look forward to hearing your testimony and to the questions. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Ricketts. Uh, there's a common theme among all five of you. You all have an incredible experience on foreign policy and, and your commitment to foreign policy. Uh, three of you are career. The other two have extensive experience in the foreign policy agenda. So you all have made a career out of foreign policy, and we, we thank you for that commitment. Uh, I'll introduce you in the order in which you will be speaking. Uh, Dr. John Kankonson, who was confirmed by the United States Senate as the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator on May 5th, 2022. He also leads the State Department's Bureau of Global Health Security and Diplomacy. Uh, that bureau serves as the department's coordinating body for work on strengthening global health security to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious diseases, including HIV AIDS, as well as elevates and integrates global health security as a core component of the U.S. national security and foreign policy. Elizabeth Hurst is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary responsible for Pakistan. She came from the U.S. Embassy Berlin, where she was a Minister Counselor for Public Diplomacy for Mission Germany. She's a member of the Senior Foreign Service. Previously, she served as SCA's Director of Security, Transnational Affairs, and Assistance Office as Charge de Fair and Deputy Chief of Mission of U.S. Embassy Tallinn, Estonia. She focused on transatlantic security on NATO's eastern flank. Uh, next, we have Troy uh, Fittrell, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service class of counselor, most recently held the position of director of the Office of West African Affairs at the Department of State. He serves as the deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia, as deputy director of the Department's Office of Southern African Affairs, and Deputy Director of the Office of International Security Cooperation in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. He was Senior Advisor to the United States Special Envoy for the Great Lakes of Africa, coordinating U.S. policy on the cross-border security, political, and economic issues in the Great Lakes region. Welcome. <laughs> Kelly Ann Smith is the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Mission to the European Union. She arrived in Brussels in July of 2021. Ms. Adam Smith is a career diplomat in the U.S. Senior Foreign Service with the rank of Minister Counselor. Before arriving at Brussels, Ms. Adam Smith served as Senior Coordinator for National Security Affairs in the Office of Vice President Kamala Harris. Previously, she served as Charge d'Affaires uh, and Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Prague. Welcome. And Ms. Harry, you've already been introduced by Sen Senator Reid, but we welcome you here and we thank you very much for your willingness to serve. So with that, uh, let us start with uh, Dr. Kangelson. Uh, each of your testimonies will be made part of our record. You may proceed as you wish. We ask that you try to summarize your, your comments and leave time for us to be able to ask you questions. Chairman Karin, Ranking Member Rekids, and members of the committee, I come before you today <clears throat> at a pivotal time as one of the greatest threats to our national security is the potential for a next pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic taught us that we are more connected and vulnerable than we ever thought. More than one million Americans lost their lives and the US economy suffered over $14 trillion in damage. Climate crisis, rapid movement of people, misinformation, disinformation are all making our jobs harder. US leadership matters now more than ever. Last year, Secretary Blinken, in close collaboration with Congress, established the Bureau of Global Health Security and Diplomacy. This bureau is organized around four core missions. One, to lead diplomatic engagement on global health security. Two, to leverage and help to coordinate U.S. foreign assistance while promoting international cooperation for health threats. Three, to elevate global health security as a top national security and foreign policy priority for our country. We have already made tremendous progress. Let me highlight three examples. First, we continue to make progress in the fight against HIV AIDS. Congress bipartisan support for PEPFAR has enabled us to save over 25 million lives. The Bureau has demonstrated success in leveraging the PEPFAR platform to address health security threats such as Ebola, Marburg, and MPOX. I look forward to working with this committee in a bipartisan fashion 
to pass a clean five years PEPFAR reauthorization in 2025. Second, I recently chaired the Pandemic Funds Strategic Committee, which will launch the five-year strategy later this month. And lastly, the Bureau launched the Foreign Ministry Channel for Global Health Security in March, which will work to coordinate, cooperate, collaborate, and communicate effectively with other like-minded countries to fight uh, infectious disease threats. It is not a question of if a new health uh, threat will emerge. It is a matter of when. The Bureau stands by to lead diplomatic efforts to support these goals. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your, your comments. Uh, Ms. Hurst. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Ricketts, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for holding this hearing. I'm honored to be here today as the President's nominee for U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka. I started my diplomatic career in South Asia more than 20 years ago and have long championed fundamental U.S. principles, including respect for human rights and economic freedoms. If confirmed, I look forward to working with Congress to advance U.S. interests in Sri Lanka. I'd like to thank a few special, special people. Most importantly, my husband, Colonel J.P. Gresh. He is my anchor and my joy, and we've built our lives around a shared love for public service and adventure. Five countries, four dogs, 15 years and counting. <laughs> we are joined by my sister, Sarah Horst, and my nieces, Bailey Evans and Kate Evans, and I hope that being in the Senate today inspires them on their own path of public service. I also want to thank my parents, my father, Dr. Jim Horst, who taught me empathy, and my mother, Reverend Dr. Judith Stone, who taught me generosity, qualities that have served me as a diplomat and a leader. Sri Lanka has been a vital partner to the United States in the Indo-Pacific region for over 76 years. And if confirmed, I'd focus on three main pillars of US interests, broadening economic cooperation, bolstering security interests, and deepening ties with people across the entire country. Sri Lanka has shown resilience and continues to make steady progress on economic growth. As the country regains its economic footing, we will continue to support Sri Lanka's people. Sri Lanka's strategic significance in the Indian Ocean calls for cooperation to address security challenges and competitors. If confirmed, I will reiterate our shared commitment to a stable, free, and open Indo-Pacific region and the rules-based international order. Sri Lanka has a vibrant civil society, and I look forward to expanding our people-to-people -people ties, including with the dynamic Sri Lankan American community. I'll support members of marginalized populations, accountability, truth and reconciliation, and transparency and justice. Let me close by noting a fourth pillar, the true source of diplomatic success, the people at U.S. Embassy Colombo. If confirmed, I will empower our interagency team and local staff to make a difference in our bilateral relationship and practice a foreign policy that benefits the American people. I look forward to working with Congress on these priorities. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll next uh, hear from Mr. Fittrell. Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Ricketts, members of the committee, I'm deeply honored to appear before you today and grateful to President Biden and Secretary Blinken for the confidence they've placed in me as their nominee. I'm proud to have my family here today with my wife, Catherine, a fellow Foreign Service officer, and my children, Madeline and Sam, who've spent their lives immersed in the Foreign Service as well, including visits to the Seychelles. Sam graduates from Virginia Commonwealth University tomorrow morning, so this is a pretty special week for us. We recently reopened an embassy in Seychelles after shuttering it in 1996. If confirmed, I would be the first ambassador in residence in Victoria in 28 years, the role having been performed since then by the person credentialed to Mauritius. I previously had the honor to be that person in Mauritius. And while we had significant success in our bilateral relationship, both sides were keenly aware that the absence of a residence ambassador was an opportunity cost. If confirmed, it would be the honor of my career to reestablish that position. Seychelles holds an important place in the Indian Ocean, astride some of the world's busiest shipping lanes, and the bilateral relationship between our two nations is built on a foundation of shared values and mutual respect. If confirmed, my top priority would be the safety and security of American citizens that make their way to the Seychelles, but I would also act energetically to promote our other national interests. I would support the democratic process and our partnership in international fora, I would promote economic development, including advocacy for U.S. exports, and further develop our robust security partnership. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Ricketts, and members of the committee for the opportunity to be here. My wife and I are both former Hill staffers, and so I'd also like to thank your staffs. I know how, much, how hard they work for you and your constituents and how well they represent you every day. 
If confirmed, I look forward to working with you in representing the interests of the American people in the Seychelles, and I hope very much to welcome you there on a visit someday soon. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. I know the staff of this committee appreciates that reference to staff, so there's a future after being a staff person here. I know they appreciate that. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Adams Smith. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Ricketts, and members of the committee, it is an honor to appear before you today as President Biden's nominee to be the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Moldova. I'm grateful to the President and Secretary Blinken for putting their trust in me, and if confirmed, I pledge to work with this committee to advance U.S. interests in Moldova. I would like to thank my husband, Steve, a career Foreign Service officer, and our children, Sophie and Ben, for their support and dedication to public service. I am also grateful to my parents, Ed and Carol, my late mother, Anna, my brother, Ed, and my sister, Deborah, who is here today. Finally, I want to recognize my in-laws, Ginny and Terry Purvis-Smith. Terry joined the Foreign Service after a full career as a Presbyterian minister. He passed away earlier this week, but I know he would have been so proud if he were here today. I have dedicated the last 29 years to advancing U.S. interests in Europe with a focus on Central and Eastern Europe. Support for the Western integration of countries in this region is fundamental to U.S. security. This is especially true for Moldova, which faces a moment in history that is filled with great opportunity and tremendous risk. If confirmed, I will be a responsible steward of U.S. resources and will prioritize the security of U.S. citizens in Moldova. The government of Moldova faces a window of opportunity to secure the country's Western orientation. Russia's aggression in Ukraine has forced Moldova to confront significant security, humanitarian, and energy impacts. With U.S. and European assistance, Moldova has managed these threats and embarked on an ambitious reform agenda. Its success has, been, has made it more, even more of a target for Russian malign influence. If confirmed, I will mobilize our personnel and resources to support Moldova's efforts to protect its democracy and enhance its security. I will also support U.S. efforts to strengthen the capacity of Moldovan institutions to combat corruption, and I will use the knowledge, experience, and contacts gained from five tours in EU member states to ensure our actions and assistance support Moldova's accession path, making it a stronger partner for the United States. Thank you for your consideration. I look forward to your questions. Uh, and thank you for your comments. Ms. Siri. Thank you, Chairman Cardin, Ranking Member Ricketts, Senator Kane, for welcoming me today. And Senator Cardin, thank you so much for your leadership um, on Mallows Bay. It is a privilege to be considered as the President's nominee for Assistant Secretary for, of State for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. I want to thank my family and Senator Reid for their continued support of me and my career, and members of the committee and their staff for taking time to meet with me. Many of the environmental challenges we face are global, and they require strong partnerships and alliances to address. If confirmed, my focus will be on working on issues where OES leadership can have a strong impact for the American people, our allies and partners, and the planet. I'd like to address three priority areas. First, pollution of all types harms human health, the environment, and economic growth. One pressing global issue is plastics pollution. If confirmed, I would work with federal agencies, Congress, stakeholders, and other countries on a strong, legally binding agreement to address the global plastic threat and to work to strengthen implementation of existing agreements and partners, partnerships to address plastic and other types of pollution. Second. Nature provides critical resources that nourish us and improve our quality of life. Loss of marine and terrestrial habitat and species increase the risk of conflict and instability. If confirmed, I will prioritize working with the committee, Congress, and other federal agencies to advance policies that address nature crimes, protect environmental defenders, and help protect and restore natural ecosystems. Third, space activities are essential to our way of life from enhancing economic opportunity to helping us find our way home. If confirmed, I would like to work to promote peaceful cooperation in space and its sustainable use in the future. OES's work is integral to in achieving the U.S. environmental, economic, and natural, national security objectives. 
If confirmed, I commit to maintaining strong lines of communications and cooperation between OES, this committee, and Congress. Thank you for considering my nomination, and I look forward to answering your questions. Uh, let me thank all five of you for your appearance here today and your comments. I have standard questions that are asked to all nominees for positions. We would appreciate going down the line, answering it either yes or no. Uh, the, the first question is, do you agree to appear before this committee and make officials from your office available to the committee and designated staff when invited? Yes. 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 <clears throat> yes. Do you commit to keep this committee fully and currently informed about the activities under your purview? Yes. 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 Do you commit to, to engaging in meaningful consultation while policies are being developed, not just providing notification after the fact? Yes. 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 Do you commit to pr promptly responding to requests for briefings and information requested by the committee and its designated staff? Yes. 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 You're all off to a really good start. <laughs> <laughs> I'll recognize Senator Kane for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations to all the nominees. And, and Mr. Fitrell, VCU is my hometown school, and I'm, I congratulate you on your son's graduation tomorrow. Uh, just sticking with you for a second, you know, it's interesting the history of the U.S. not having an embassy in the Seychelles. It was a, a cost-savings move. Seychelles is a, a pretty important country. They're, classified as free in Freedom House's 2023 Freedom in the World Index of Governance Conditions. Seychelles has enjoyed significant economic success. It's long had the highest per capita GDP in Africa, classed by the World Bank as a high-income country. I sometimes think in the U.S. we tend to focus a lot of attention on problems without rewarding success, and that we might be better at magnifying success if we work with the successful and shine a spotlight on their success and then use that to create a desire in the region to be as successful as this country. And so the fact that the Seychelles Embassy was closed in the 1990s just as a cost savings move um, and then served from Mauritius is kind of a bit of evidence that I think fits into a pattern that we have of not paying attention to successful countries. I'm so glad that the Biden administration decided that this was a relationship that was worthy of the U.S. reestablishing and having managed the responsibility from Mauritius earlier in your career, I mean, you're the perfect person to have the opportunity to reopen this. And I understand that this has also been very well received by the Seychelles that the U.S. is upgrading the relationship in this way. Am I correct about that? Yeah, thank you for the question, Senator. I couldn't agree more. Yes, the host government is extremely pleased that we've finally returned to the Seychelles. When I was re uh, credentialed there and representing the United States on my visits, I never had a meeting when it was not mentioned, why don't you have an embassy here? Uh, I've spent a good part of the last 15 years advocating uh, for this, and understand that that predates the return to uh, true constitutional democracy with the change of, of power between parties. Uh, but it just simply became even more important since then, uh, as you said, to recognize success, to be part of that, to encourage it, and yeah, to, to find ways to reward that. We have national interests there, uh, and it's important to be there in order to, in order to exercise those interests. I generally think that we do much better in, in trying to encourage success if we're not lecturing others on how to be successful, but if there are examples in their region of success that they can look at and draw lessons from. And I am excited that you'll be in this position with this upgraded responsibility. Um, sorry, I wanna come to you now in your uh, position on an oceans question. I'm the chair of the America Subcommittee uh, here on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I'm really worried about the um, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, primarily by China, uh, primarily in the Pacific. Talk a little bit about, from the State Department perspective, what you might do to prioritize dealing with that challenge. Senator, thank you very much for that question. As you pointed out, IUU um, fishing, it, it, it impacts uh, ocean health. It is one of the largest causes of um, overfishing. And so it means it is a food security threat 
to a number of uh, countries. It's an economic threat to our fishermen. Um, and it's a national um, and human rights threat because of forced labor and human um, rights abuses that take place. Uh, there's a lot. Um, first of all, I really want to say thank you to Congress for the Maritime Safe um, Act. We need a whole of government approach, and that starts from when the fish gets on a boat um, all the way to when it ends up on a consumer's plate here uh, in the U.S. And so there's a lot of work um, that we're trying to do through the uh, interagency process um, to elevate uh, illegal um, or IUU uh, fishing. It would be a priority of mine. Um, I would look forward to working with this committee and Congress to see if there's even more tools that we could use to address IUU. We, we would love to work with you on that. One last question that I wasn't intending to ask, but you mentioned space in your opening testimony, and obviously a concern about international cooperation in space is with more and more satellites, more and more platforms up in space, the risks of collisions that would damage investments but also create debris that could cause all kinds of other challenges is the classic kind of a problem for which there has to be some global norms and rules and and solutions to keep everybody's investment safe. What role, uh, other parts of the U.S. government are involved in this, but what role would your office have in trying to find the right rules of the road? Sure. Um, OES works with F, uh, Department of Defense, NASA, um, FCC on issues around potential marine debris. OES's specific role is around the peaceful use of space, so it's about trying to do best practices um, in order to avoid collisions, um, if orbital debris does take place, um, you know, working with the country, if it's our debris or if it's their debris um, as well. So it's really around space diplomacy efforts. Okay. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Ricketts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Kengasong, the University of Nebraska Medical Center has uh, one of three biocontainment facilities in the country and the only federally funded quarantine space. If this is not a commitment I'm asking you to make, I'm just saying that if you're confirmed, I'd recommend visiting. Uh, they were instrumental in taking some of uh, Ebola patients from Africa, Americans who had been infected with Ebola, and treating them here in the United States, as well as uh, some of the first COVID patients as well. So uh, certainly worth your time, if you're confirmed, to, to make a visit. Not asking you to make a commitment, but keep in mind. Uh, Ms. Harry, so within OES, uh, the uh, Office of Science and Technology Cooperation oversees our STAs, as I was talking about before. The U.S. has 60 of these uh, with countries like Canada and Japan. However, I'm sure you agree that the STA with the uh, People's Republic of China is different. I'm fr in my opinion, frankly, China's been playing for us for a fool for three decades now. Uh, it's an adversary. They practice civil-military fusion to leverage their civilian and commercial resource for military and defense purposes. And the evidence suggests they're going to continue to look for opportunities to exploit partnerships organized under the SEDA to advance their military objectives. In February, the Biden administration in Beijing agreed to extend their SDA for another six months to continue negotiations. Um, so I want to ask you a few simple questions uh, that I hope we can agree on. The, uh, do you believe that Congress should be able to provide the necessary oversight on an STA with the PRC? Senator, um, thank you very much for your questions and, and expressing the concerns you have with uh, uh, STA with PRC. I appreciate that. Um, I am aware that there is a notification um, in the appropriations bill. And yes, I do think that Congress should um, be consulted as we look through uh, a new renewal of the STA with PRC. Great. Uh, if the administration were to finalize negotiations on a new STA uh, with the PRC, do you believe Congress should receive detailed justification on what was agreed to and, and why our national security interest and why it is in our national security interest before the agreement goes into effect? Uh, Senator, um, if confirmed, I would be happy to make sure that we are um, fully briefing uh, your staff and other interested staff in the STA. Great, thank you. Uh, do you believe that a specific text of any negotiated agreement should have clear, defined guardrails on what is permissible? Uh, what are principal research areas for collaboration, what are not, and would you agree that we want to make clear that areas of dual-use concerns should be made off-limits? Uh, Senator, um, if confirmed, uh, I would, I would want to talk a little bit to the State Department and their lawyers about um, what can go into an STI. I don't know if there's restrictions like that. I'm used to it kind of putting guardrails on um, 
how the China and uh, the U.S. would work together versus specifically saying what could or could not um, do. So if confirmed, I'd be happy to get back to you specifically on an STA, including um, types of research that could or could not take place. All right, great. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears on you just a little mm -hmm. bit here. Uh, the U.S. Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs is responsible for formulating and implementing U.S. policy on international issues concerning the ocean, the Arctic, and the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. As you know, uh, prior to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. collaborated with Russia uh, on Arctic climate research. However, soon after in, uh, the invasion, that collaboration rightfully stopped. Since that time, Putin's war has continued to rage on with Tens of thousands of innocent Ukrainians have been killed. Thousands of Ukrainian children have been abducted. Millions of Ukrainians have become refugees, and countless Ukrainians have endured brutal, brutal human rights abuses. Do you believe that it should remain our policy that the United States will not collaborate with Russia on any research in the Arctic until Putin ends his war in Ukraine? Senator, I agree with that. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, Russia obviously isn't the only adversary we have to worry about in the Arctic. The PRC has a self-proclaimed near-Arctic state. I, this is crazy. <laughs> has expanded its presence there as well. For decades, Russia has actively ex excluded the PRC and other non-Arctic countries from playing a role in its backyard. However, since Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine and Putin's No Limits partnership with Xi, Russia has been forced to embrace an increased PRC role in the Arctic. Last year, we saw the PRC begin to send personnel to research stations located in Norway's uh, Svalbard and in Iceland after a lengthy hiatus. Uh, we saw Russian Coast Guard sign an Arctic cooperation agreement with the China Coast Guard. And we saw the PRC's Polar Research Institute make startling announcement that it plans to deploy listening devices on a large scale in the Arctic Ocean. In your view, how should the United States respond to the PRC's growing research and other activities in the Arctic, and how should U.S. policy on this question take into account increased cooperation between Russia and the People's Republic of China? Senator, thanks for um, that, that question. I, I appreciate it. So the U.S. is, first of all, about the near Arctic nation. Um, I'm angry with you, with you. I don't know what a near Arctic nation is. Um, the government. They made that term up, didn't they? Yeah, I, I believe that is yeah. the case. Um, you know, the Arctic governance is, should um, be with the Arctic nations. Um, the U.S. is in a very important Arctic nation. There is the Arctic Council, um, which has been kind of the preeminent area for looking at how we um, do management in the Arctic um, with Russia's illegal invasion of the Ukraine. Um, the U.S. and other countries pause participation. Um, there's efforts now um, to continue to do work, but not engage in anything that the Republic, uh, the, sorry, the uh, Russians are um, taking uh, part in. Um, I think one of the th very significant things that um, that the U.S. recently did was extend its um, continental shelf. That gave us much more territory, actually, in the Arctic, which means we have much more control over who can do scientific research, um, what can actually take place in that. I think through the um, Arctic Council and other work with uh, uh, Arctic states that don't include Russia, we have to have a unified um, front about how we're going to approach the research that is taking place and the threats that it poses um, to the other Arctic nations. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gangensong, uh, first, thank you for mentioning the need for the five-year reauthorization of the PEPFAR program. Uh, that's something that uh, this committee is very much interested in, in pursuing. Uh, we're disappointed we have a short-term extension. We do believe we need the five years, so I'm glad to hear you mention that. The position that you've been nominated to, the Ambassador at Large for Global Health Security and Diplomacy, there will be an interesting relationship that I would like to get your views on. There's a turf issue between the State Department and USAID on health issues. Your responsibility is to the State Department directly. We have the USAID that's engaged also in health care issues, and there have been some concern about the mission creep between the two divisions, the full division and USAID. Can you just tell me how you plan to work with USAID so that the turf differences does not at all impact on our ability to be effective in dealing with global health issues? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think I want to assure you that um, it's very clear once the Bureau was launched that what our role will be. 
we will be leading in three key areas. First of all is to, as I said earlier, lead with diplomatic engagement with all global health security uh, issues, related issues. Secondly, to elevate global health security as part of our foreign policy. And lastly, to uh, coordinate our foreign assistance so that it can help uh, advance our international health cooperation and global health security. If you look at the recently launched global health security strategy that the White House just released, um, uh, on page 32 of that document, it clearly defines the roles and responsibilities of the several agencies. A beautiful document, great uh, strategy. And in there, it, allow, it outlines 13 uh, functions of what the State Department uh, should be doing in the overall space of global health security. So it's very clear that through the interagency collaboration, <clears throat> constantly engaging with uh, USAID, CDC, HHS, and NIH will be able to leverage more effectively and coordinate our global health security functions. Of course, one of the areas that will help is burden sharing to have our uh, allies step up and do more than they currently are doing in this global area. The United States is by far the leader on resources. Uh, Senator Coons, who chairs the subcommittee on appropriations that deal with foreign aid, uh, will tell you that he doesn't have enough money. So if we only have a limited dollars available, the competition between monies going into direct programs at USAID or going into your agency are going to be in discussion. How do you assure us that that discussions will be positive and that it will not deter from the working relationship between you and USAID? Absolutely. We, we didn't the new bureau, <clears throat> the Bureau of Global Health Security and Diplomacy, there's a program side of it, which is the PEPFAR uh, chairman, which you alluded to. And that has existed for the past 21 years with clarity of roles and, and responsibilities. The global health security side of that, the new bureau is mainly around policy coordination and diplomacy, leading with diplomacy. I'll give you an, a good example to, to substantiate that. Last year in February, if you recall, there was a Marburg outbreak in Equatorial Guinea in Central Africa. None of our agencies were present in that country. The only presence we had was our ambassador. And he played a critical role of engaging with the leadership, the political leadership of that country to enable us to deploy assets to respond to that threat, which includes CDC deployment, USAID deployment, and WHO. When discussions were tense, where the government of that country said, we don't want need any further uh, cooperation, our mission and ambassador was the only person in country that broke that the relationship. So that's the kind of the coordination and leveraging that we, we hope the new bureau will, uh, will enable us to be more effective in our global health security uh, response. Thank you. Ms. Hurst, uh, since the Civil War in 2009 in Sri Lanka, there's still been an issue of reconciliation and accountability. Uh, there's concern about corruption in the country. There's concern in regards to human rights. The Draconian Online Safety Act uh, is looked at as trying to stifle any dissent in the country. So human rights are going to be front and center in, in our expectation of our mission in Sri Lanka. Uh, can you assure us that that is going to be a key priority of the mission? and that the U.S. mission will be there to speak out on behalf of those individuals that, whose voices are being difficult to be heard in the country today? Senator, um, thank you very much for your question, and I share your concern and your commitment to human rights. And if I am confirmed, I will put accountability, governance, anti-corruption efforts at the forefront of what our mission will be doing, including working with partners in civil society across Sri Lanka. Thank you. Senator Barrasso. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Shaheen, had you just come in if you'd like to go first? That's fine. Senator. Feel free. Okay, thanks. I'd like to talk about the World Health Organization, if we could. Uh, the Biden administration has vowed to reform the World Health Organization. Uh, but it threw away its leverage early on, in my opinion. I, the administration, uh, against the advice of many, rejoined the World Health Organization, gave it $200 million without insisting on a single reform. 
In a few weeks, the administration is expected to commit the United States to two international agreements that would expand the, the World Health Organization's authority during a global pandemic. Uh, last week, I joined my Republican colleagues in calling on President Biden to reject these agreements, what I believe are harmful. Yesterday, uh, the UK announced that they will refuse to sign the World Health Organization's pandemic accord, saying that they will only support the adoption if it is firmly in the UK national interest and respects national sovereignty. December 13th last year, during a hearing held by the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, you said, quote, this administration is firmly committed to ensuring that the World Health Organization implements a comprehensive set of organizational reforms, particularly to strengthen its governance, its budgetary and financial management processes, and to improve oversight to strengthen the organization's efficiency and effectiveness. You know, instead of focusing on reforming the World Health Organization, the administration is choosing to hand over U.S. sovereignty to them. We are the United States, not the United Nations. So the question is, do you commit to ensuring that U.S. sovereignty is not infringed upon? <clears throat> Senator, let me respond in the affirmative. Absolutely, the, the sovereignty and security of the United States will not be undermined in this negotiation process. We have been very insistent that uh, there are two articles in the pandemic accord discussions that I would like to uh, just reiterate. Article 3 states clearly that WHO has no authority over sovereign states. Absolutely not. Article 24 of that same negotiation further expands and it states clearly that the, neither the Secretariat of WHO nor the Director General has any authority over any sovereign state in the areas of dictating, telling them what to do in terms of mandate use of any tools, including vaccines, uh, masks, lockdown, etc. I think it's absolutely very clear in Article 24. We will oppose any, any attempt or any perception of that accord that seeks to undermine or is perceived as going to undermine the sovereignty of the United States. I will just end, Senator, by saying that the sole purpose for us in the discussion is to protect our national interests, to protect our national interests. And there are three things that we are seeking to achieve in this negotiation. One is to ensure that we have capacity globally that can allow us to easily detect prevent and control and respond to disease outbreaks. As we know, a disease outbreak anywhere in the world becomes a threat right here. One million Americans died because of COVID-19. Secondly, is to ensure that we have access in a timely fashion to biologic materials, including specimens, data, that will allow us to develop vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics that will protect us. And lastly, the ability to distribute those um, resources in an equitable manner. So following the UK's announcement just yesterday about their refusal to sign, if the UK, is the UK alone able to block the passage of the accords? If not, how many other member countries would need to oppose it in order for the accords to fail? The, the accord, Senator, is still being discussed, including as of this morning, about uh, several issues, especially our uh, areas related to intellectual property, our technology transfer, uh, pathogen access and sharing, as I indicated. Uh, this accord has been going on, the discussions, for about two years. So we remain uh, at, at hopeful that countries that are discussing will see value in our collective security and, and learn the lessons, as Chairman said, of what COVID taught us about our common vulnerability. So we, we, uh, we just don't know exactly who is going to oppose it or not, but we have to show our leadership. As I said in my introduction, this is the moment for us to show the leadership. We have been a global herd leader over the years, and this is uh, not a moment for us to relent our leadership. Mr. Chairman, can I have one, one quick last question, and it's to Ms. Kelly Adams-Smith. Uh, Moldova's recent almost exclusively reliant on Russian energy. Uh, Tuesday, Norway and Moldova signed an agreement to tighten cooperation in, the, uh, in their energy sector. C can you tell me the current status of the Moldova's energy grid? 
Thank you very much for the question, Senator. It is true that uh, Moldova was 100% dependent on Russia for its energy sources. Uh, after the Ukrainian, uh, the Russian reinvasion of Ukraine, it became clear that that was no longer possible. And the Moldovan government, with assistance from the United States and uh, European allies, has made uh, some successes in becoming less dependent. The energy grid, uh, the electricity, electricity grid of uh, Moldova is now hooked up to the European grid. USAID is funding a... Um, uh, an electrical line to uh, between Romania and Moldova, and uh, the United uh, Moldova is now also buying for the first time um, non-Russian gas, which is an incredibly positive um, uh, development. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Congratulations to each of you on your nominations. Um, Ms. Adam Smith, I want to begin with you because I had the opportunity to travel to Moldova for the first time back in February, and I was very impressed with the commitment of the Moldovans we talked to about joining the EU and looking west and concern about what's happening in the war in Ukraine and what Russia is doing um, was also um, met with President Sandu, um, and she's now, and she shared her focus on judicial reforms and how important she thinks that is ahead of the upcoming presidential elections. So and I think rightfully so that without a reformed judiciary, it will be very hard for Moldova to continue the reforms that they need to make. So can you talk about what more we can do, what more you would do um, if confirmed to help support Moldova as they're looking at these, uh, particularly the judicial reforms? Senator, thank you very much for the question. Uh, our assistance has focused on helping the Moldovan government improve its rule of law and fight anti-corruption, especially in terms of uh, increasing the independence of the judicial sector. We have assisted uh, the Moldovan government in creating a system for pre-vetting of prosecutors and judges and created a model court system. And if I'm confirmed, we will continue these efforts, but also focus on working with creating space for free and independent media and working with civil society because those are absolutely essential in holding the government to account on its anti-corruption path. Um, the other thing we heard concerns about is the amount of Russian disinformation that is being spread throughout Moldova. Um, just this week, there was a Politico article that pointed out that Russia is responsible for circulating deep fake videos of President Sandu to try and undermine her re-election campaign. So is there more that we should be doing to help the Moldovans protect themselves from this kind of disinformation? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, Mo Russian malign inf influence takes many forms in Moldova. Uh, there is this disinformation and propaganda. There's also energy coercion. Uh, hybrid and cyber attacks. There's also con conventional uh, threats. Uh, our assistance is focused on helping the government uh, increase its resilience towards this disinformation. Um, I think they're learning a lot. They learned a lot from last year's uh, regional or local elections. And uh, is there more that we can do? Absolutely. I believe that we should use all the tools in our toolkit uh, if, if uh, there is evidence of election tampering or uh, use of propaganda or deep fakes that um, interfere with the running of free and fair elections. We should consider using sanctions and visa bans and uh, to send a, a powerful signal that this cannot happen in Moldova. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And hopefully the Global Engagement Center can help us as we're thinking about how we can help other countries. Ms. Horst, the... People's Republic of China has considerable economic leverage over Sri Lanka because of its infrastructure investments and loans. Now, I was pleased to see a recent U.S. investment in Sri Lanka's port capabilities, but it's really a drop in the bucket compared to existing Chinese capital in the country. So can you talk about what the implications are of China's ability to leverage infrastructure investments and other 
um, energy, other issues in the country, and what more we should be thinking about as we're trying to provide a, a counterbalance to what China's doing. Senator, thank you very much for that question. And it gets to the heart of um, the Indo-Pacific strategy. And mm -hmm. Sri Lanka is an incredibly important member or an incredibly important part of that, not only because of the geography, but also because it is a democracy with um, an open economy. And so the investment by DFC that you named is a great example of how we're using tools that the United States government has to invest and show a different model of investment that is different than what um, the PRC might offer. Um, this is a, a half a billion dollar investment in what we see as Sri Lanka's future. It is transparent, it will promote good governance, and this is exactly the kind of um, alternative that we feel will just demonstrate to Sri Lankans that they have a choice, and we think that our model is better. Um, thank you. I'm out of time, but I just returned from a trip to the Indo-Pacific about a month ago, and one of the things we heard in the countries that we visited where China has tried to make those kinds of investments is that they would rather do business with the United States because for all the reasons you just gave, um, but unfortunately, we have not uh, come to, always come to the table in ways that can provide the support that those countries need. So thank you. I appreciate your comments, and I don't know if you want to respond to that before I'm out uh, of time. Se Senator, if I'm confirmed, I will find ways to bring all of the resources that the United States and our friends and allies have to help continue along these efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me start by congratulating all of you on your, your nominations. And uh, I just want to second what uh, Senator Shaheen said with respect to Moldova and others. Um, Look forward to working uh, with you, uh, Ms. Adam Smith, if you're confirmed. Um, I do want to pick up on the Sri Lanka question. I have a long-term uh, affinity to Sri Lanka, and I visited Sri Lanka uh, last year on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of um, U.S.-Sri Lankan relations, and uh, I believe Ambassador Julie Chung has been doing a, a great job, and I know you will as well, uh, if you're confirmed, uh, Ms. Horst. Um, I was pleased to see the DFC commitment. Uh, could you speak a little bit about how Sri Lanka is uh, progressing with respect to the uh, IMF reform package? As you know, uh, this was a, a long time in coming. There have been serious economic issues. Uh, how do you gauge uh, progress with respect to the IMF uh, reform package? Senator Van Halen, thank you, and thank you. I know you do have a very special relationship to South Asia and to Sri Lanka, so I appreciate very much your interest. Uh, the IMF is working closely with um, partners and with the Sri Lankan government to make sure that Sri Lanka can get back on better economic footing. We are making sure that any debt negotiations treat all partners fairly and, uh, and that are transparent. And there's an element of the IMF program that also looks at governance to make sure that any IMF programs that come in also take care of the most vulnerable and are spread fairly. So if I am confirmed, I will continue to work and follow in the mighty footsteps of Ambassador Chung to make sure that we continue uh, to work with the IMF to help Sri Lanka on economic footing. Well, thank you. And you know, while I was there, one of the programs that uh, we've got that uh, I think was appreciated was greater transparency in the budgeting process um, and uh, look forward to continuing our conversation uh, on that piece as well, which is important to the United States, important to the IMF, and important to others. Um, and I, I do want to also, I, I know Senator Cardin raised the issues of, of human rights. I had a number of conversations about progress towards transitional justice, um, and so I do look forward to continuing that conversation as well. Um, Ms. Sari, it's great to have a, a Marylander uh, as part of uh, the group. Congratulations. As you well know, um, as we seek to make a transition toward cleaner energy, critical minerals are a critical part of this. Um, the United States really got caught you know, decades behind uh, China in terms of um, sourcing of minerals, the developing of, uh, of the batteries. Uh, but one of the sources of some of these minerals are these undersea nodules, but so maybe that's an opportunity, but clearly there are also environmental risks. So my question to you, to you is how, how do you think about that? Uh, and especially in light of the fact that the United States uh, is not uh, part of the Law of the Seas Convention, does that 
does that put us at a disadvantage as part in this conversation? Uh, Senator, thank you so much for the, the question. The U.S. Um, not being part of the law of the seas actually does put us at a disadvantage. Um, there's an international seabed authority that is responsible for this type of um, deep sea mining. The U.S. is able to be an observer on it, and um, the U.S. has worked very hard to make sure if deep sea mining does go forward that it's done in a precautionary manner with strong protections for the environment. But because we can only be an observer, um, we don't have as much influence, and uh, it's the PRC that is moving most um, quickly forward um, with, uh, with development. And um, I can tell you that um, whenever we try to exert something under the law of the sea because we're not a member, the PRC um, does not feel that it needs to follow our advice. So if confirmed, I would be working very hard on this issue. Um, OES tries to work on the recycling aspects and tries to make sure that any type of um, critical mineral um, is done in an mining is done in an environmentally sustainable manner. I appreciate that. I've, I've long believed it was a mistake for us not to be part of the Law of Sea Convention. I hope, you know, Congress will, will, will get with it given the disadvantages we face. Um, Ambassador Kangasong, it is uh, wonderful to see you again. I think the last time we were in person may have been in South Africa um, on the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR. So thank you for your your leadership uh, there. And as you know, many of us believe that the, the success of PEPFAR uh, can be um, built on uh, in terms of creating a, a preventive health and health infrastructure. Could you talk a little bit about how we might leverage the success of PEPFAR into other areas of, of health Thank you, thank you, Senator. Good to see you, see you again, and thank you uh, all for the support in securing the one-year reauthorization of PEPFA to next um, March, which, as uh, the chairman said, we look forward to working with you to reauthorizing it for a full, clean five five years. Senator, over the past 21 years, PEPFA has been extremely successful and impactful in saving more than 25 million lives, preventing 5.5 million children born free from HIV infection. But in addition to that, it has built a large platform that is currently being used when needs arise in responding to other disease threats like cholera outbreaks like uh, Ebola outbreaks, the Marburg, and uh, uh, MPOX currently going on in, in DRC. So we should be very, very proud of, of that. I mean, those are not taking away resources from PEPFA, but leveraging those uh, systems and institutions that we already have in country. Uh, and that is what I believe PEPFA should continue to do. That is, uh, stay focused on its mission to bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat by the year 2030 which means bringing down the rates of new infections down to below 90% compared to 2010. But with that platform, uh, given the current context of rapidly emerging diseases, we continue to, uh, countries, partner countries continue to use that. Uh, to get that goal of bringing HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat, as uh, you, all of us discussed when we're in South Africa, we need to look at the priority populations that uh, we need to invest in more and be very laser focused in adolescent girls and, and young women and bring down the rates of infections among those in children and in key populations. Put, put our resources there so that we maintain the gains that we've achieved over the years and accelerate so that we can absolutely effectively get to 2030. Thank you, and thank you for all your good work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Schatz. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to all of the nominees for your willingness to serve. Uh, Ms. Sari, good to see you again. Um, I want to talk to you <clears throat> first about IUU. Um, I just want to understand how you envision working to implement some of the tasks recommended by the IUU working group between agencies, between NOAA, between state. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of cross-agency coordination that, um, that is necessary, and I'm wondering how you intend to prioritize your tasks. 
Senator, thank you very much for the question. Um, I know you've been a long time person trying to combat IUU fishing, so I appreciate your leadership on that. I think first of all, um, the Maritime Safe Act by creating an interagency group and uh, OES is the current chair of that has been incredibly important. I think sometimes people hear about you know, illegal unregulated fisheries and they think, oh, it's just an environmental issue and it is not. It touches on everything. It's a, it's a human rights issue. It's a food security issue. It's also an environmental security issue. So we really need to, through this interagency partnership, have everybody have very concrete responsibilities, measurable outcomes, and take action. Even within the Department of State, we need to work very closely with INL, um, with D DRL, and then also with EAP, where most of um, you know IUU is either taking place or the countries that are involved in, in IUU fishing as well. Um, and I would just add to that, it's a, th there's a line of effort that is purely at the diplomatic level. In mm -hmm. other words, even exactly. if we didn't, we do, even if we didn't care about the kind of conservation and ecological impacts here, even if there were no economic aspect that mattered to us, uh, it's important to our friends and allies in, in the Pacific in particular. Um, and, you know, I, we just had a, a good meeting with a number of ambassadors from uh, Pacific Island nations, and IUU always comes up. So I, I'm wondering mm -hmm. if there are some kind of small bore uh, ways we can start to provide assistance because I am, look, you gave a really smart and cogent answer. The problem is that if I'm meeting with the ambassador from Palau or mm -hmm. Fiji or the Federated States of Micronesia, um, they're not sure how quickly any of that is going to happen. That's a lot of three and four letter agency yep. names. Agreed. And they're kind of going, so is help on the way, way or, not? or not? So what can we do in the short run? So I think there's um, the, the ship rider program that's taking place in um, the Pacific Islands, I think has been very effective. And that's where uh, local law enforcement rides aboard with Coast Guard. Um, and can go and enforce um, with areas. State is also working very closely with USAID. Um, technical assistance, and, um, and if confirmed, I'd be very happy to, to work with, your, with you and your staff and work with the, the Pacific Islands to figure out what more kind of technical assistance we have. Good governance is also going to be important. Um, I actually think, Senator, one of the things we also need to do, diplomacy is important. I don't think Americans want to have illegal fishing on their plate, so we need to actually figure out working with the other partners, too, about how we're going to stop those chains and, and have the countries of origins of where fish can take place be part of that, that dialogue as we think about a whole-of-government approach. We we'll just add that I, I think, um, and I am satisfied right now that okay. people are monitoring um, technological developments, mm -hmm. but I, I just do think that there could be a moment at which we sort of move from uh, we've got to be, we've got to pe people, we have to have ships, we have to be underway mm -hmm. um, totally to um, a lot of this is about monitoring, a lot of this is about people knowing that we have eyes on them, mm -hmm. because there are extremely rare situations where this would get kinetic, and yeah. so I think there may be cheaper ways to have eyes and presence throughout the Pacific. I know that um, the Navy is thinking along these lines as well, but drone technology, satellite technology has come a very, very long way. Mm -hmm. And the bureaucracy, which is, I think, moving in the right direction, understandably is implementing a plan that was many, many years in the making. And so I just want you to be receptive to a disruptive technology and how you'd integrate that into a kind of the machinery that's already on its way. Senator, I would be very interested in that. I'd be happy to work with your office as confirmed. I think this is, I, I, the, what happens aboard these illegal fishing um, boats is just, it's awful. Um, it, they had tremendous human rights violation. Anything that we can do to stop it as soon as possible, I think is something we should explore. Thank you very much. Let me follow up on Senator Schatz's point and others that have raised this illegal fishing issue. It's well be beyond the Pacific nations or the Asian Pacific. I was in Ecuador, and the PRC vessels there are outrageous in some of the richest fishing areas in the world. Uh, and you're absolutely right. It is, it's not only a, an environmental disaster and a, an abuse of, of rights, uh, but it is also a human rights violation on the way they use motherships and have forced labor for lengthy periods of time. 
And you, we do need a strategy that will work in the short term as well as the long term. The technology is there to be able to track these vessels. They have to communicate. We can track the communications. Uh, they're violating laws. We need international enforcement. And that's not going to happen without US leadership. So I just really want to underscore, as you've heard from so many members on this committee, uh, that, that, that has to be a top priority. And we're looking forward to your suggestions as to how we can put a spotlight on this so more Americans understand what's going on. Because it is, the, it, it, ultimately, as consumers, we can put a lot of pressure on this globally. So we, we need to do that. I also want to mention uh, the area that you mentioned in your comments about plastics and the negotiations in regards to international treaty, uh, the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee. And you'll play a major role in that. Uh, there's a lot of interest in trying to have an aggressive policy led by the United States, and this treaty might give us an opportunity to do that on dealing with the plastics issues in, in our waters. So but there are two areas that are a very high priority to our committee. I want to ask uh, one additional question in regards to human rights, uh, uh, whether it's Moldova, which uh, needs to move towards the EU, needs to uh, protect itself from Russia's uh, aggression, we have the Transnistria issue that has ultimately has to be resolved. Uh, and we have a, a weakness in their judicial system and prosecutorial system in which the EU and U US can help. So Adam Smith, I just really want to get your commitment that we need to work with Moldova to try to strengthen their internal institutions so they can transition closer to EU sessions and to uh, the West. Mr. Um, Senator, thank you very, very much for that question. I absolutely commit to working with this committee and working um, as hard as I can to ensure that Moldova is taking is resilient enough to take the steps that it needs to take uh, to uh, take the reforms and become an EU member after a very rigorous accession process. I firmly believe that it is going through this process that will enable the country to um, reach the future that it wants. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be short. And they are going to need the United States and European allies working together to make sure that the country is able to take all the steps along the way to become an EU member state. And there's a strong diaspora community that can help in this transition. Uh, so it's another area that we might want to try to, to develop that could help Moldova along this path. Thank you very much for that comment, Senator. Absolutely true. The Moldovan diaspora in the United States, more than 50,000 people who are a great source of uh, a great resource for uh, the Moldovan government. If I'm confirmed, I intend to work with allies and partners across Europe as well to ensure that we're activating the diaspora in those countries as well to give as much assistance and advice and support to the Moldovan government, which needs the human capacity uh, to enact all of these reforms. And as you said, the Moldovan diaspora can be an important source of strength for them. Ms. Hertz, I, uh, just to follow up on our questionings on the human rights in Sri Lanka, uh, I want your commitment to keep us informed as to the progress you are making in dealing with the accountability issues, uh, to deal with the ability of, to express dissent of government uh, with this recent law that was passed, and what our mission is doing to advance the basic freedoms for the people of Sri Lanka. Senator Cardin, if I'm confirmed, you have my commitment to work with your committee and um, Congress to make sure that we are holding everyone accountable for the international standards that we want them to adhere to. Thank you. Senator Ricketts. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Horst, I, I wanted to follow up on uh, uh, just the, the conversations we'd had about the PRC. Um, the Indian Ocean, obviously, is critical to the PRC's strategic and economic interests as well as geopolitical rivalry with India. Increasingly, PRC research vessels with ties to the PLA Navy have conducted sweeping surveys 
of the undersea floor in the Indian Ocean. These types of ocean surveys are carried out by vessels that have research applications for energy resources and marine environments. However, the data can also be used for military purposes, including how to man maneuver and obscure submarines during a conflict. According to CSIS, the 13 PRC vessels undertaking the bulk of the survey and research activity in the Indian Ocean since 2020 all have links to the PLA and all display suspicious behavior, including docking at PLA military ports or temporarily turning off their tracking devices. In January, Sri Lanka declared a year-long moratorium on PRC research vessels entering the waters. Do you believe the presence of the PRC research vessels in the Indian Ocean poses a threat to the national security interests of the United States and our, our partner allies in the region? Senator, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Sorry. Uh, Senator, thank you very much. And I, I, we share your concern about what PRC research vessels could be doing in the Indian Ocean, which is why um, cooperation with Sri Lanka on maritime domain, domain awareness is a key part of our security assistance. It allows the Sri Lankans to have the capability and the technology to be able to patrol their own waters and help defend their sovereignty. And if I'm confirmed, we will continue to work with the Sri Lankans to build their own capabilities. Right. So if confirmed, will you commit to work then to, to ensure the moratorium is maintained in place as well? So um, we are working very closely to make sure that there's fair um, access to ports for all ships. So you don't want to keep, keep, keep the moratorium on the PRC vessels out? Uh, we, would want to, we would want to make sure that uh, we are working with them. We have huge concerns about PRC vessels, and we have asked for that moratorium. We think it is in Sri Lanka's best interests. Okay, great. And then I just uh, finally wrap up by saying, uh, Ms. Adam Smith, uh, uh, Steve King, former ambassador to the Czech Republic, you were his deputy chief of mission, had nothing but high praise for you and gave you his highest recommendation. Mr. Senator, that is so nice to hear. Thank you very yeah. much. My <laughs> pleasure. My pleasure. Mr. Chairman. The uh, record of the committee will remain open to close the business tomorrow for members who may be asking questions for the record. Uh, for any questions for the record directed to any one of you, we appreciate you try to respond to that as thoroughly and quickly as, as possible so that we can uh, complete our work in the committee in an expeditious way. Again, with our thanks, uh, our hearing will be adjourned. Thank you.